please welcome Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Royal Caribbean Cruises, Richard Fain, for a discussion with Skift News Editor, Hannah Sampson. Hi, good morning, everybody. Wow, good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, our speaker, Richard Fain, he's been CEO of Royal Caribbean Cruises for almost 30 years. Next year it'll be 30 years. And a little background, the company owns brands including Royal Caribbean International, Celebrity Cruises, and Azamara Club Cruises, which just announced it's adding a ship this morning. Um, PSA, don't forget at the end of the session we have a few minutes to take questions from you guys. Um, Sessions Q&A on the app is where you can do it, or you can go to slido.com, and that's S-L-I-D-O, and enter hashtag skift forum. All that's out of the way. Richard. Thanks, Hannah, good to be here. Good to have you. Last time we talked, it was shortly after Hurricane Irma, and um, it was bad, but it, we weren't sure people were still gonna be talking about it now. Uh, along comes Hurricane Maria, which pummeled some of the destinations that got hurt by Irma and devastated Puerto Rico. Um, Key West is still recovering from Irma. A lot of the destinations that you call on were affected. So small picture, how is this affecting your business? It's not small picture to you, but um, <laughs> how is this affecting your business? And in the bigger picture, how do you expect the Caribbean to recover? How long do you expect it to take to recover? Um, well, it's been a, a really terrible summer for that, from that point of view. Um, you mentioned the ones we've had here. We had Harvey before that. We've had the two earthquakes in Mexico, which were horrific. And since a fair amount of our operations are in Asia, we've also had some typhoons out there. They make it easier on us because they call them typhoons instead of hurricanes. So we don't have six hurricanes. We have four hurricanes and two typhoons. But not easy. Much better. Really not easy, yeah. Um, and, you know, when you live in South Florida and you have spent your most of your business career working with the Caribbean nations, to see the amount of devastation, it's, it's just horrible. Um, and to see... Um, the people that have been put out of their homes, um, electric grids just disintegrated. Um, it's really hard to look at. Um, but it's also interesting to see, it, it really tells something else. One of the things I think is interesting is just how much it points out the importance of tourism. So when we've talked to these countries, and by the way, something about the hurricanes this year made them particularly difficult. They seemed to know exactly where our ships would be and when we needed to turn over. Uh, and they went to exactly the, the worst possible ports on the worst possible You've been lucky port. for a lot of years. It, it, uh, you're right. Yeah. But it all came back in one yeah. time. But the interesting thing is, um, it really shows when we've talked to um, the leaders in all these countries, um, one of the things they're most worried about is how quickly will tourism come back? So what's the answer? And well, I think much quicker than most people realize. Um, one of the nice things about this storm is it really has brought out the best in many people. And even a place like um, Puerto Rico, which has been particularly hard hit with two consecutive storms. I mean, I can't even imagine what it's like to feel the two coming down on you. Yeah. And it'll take it a long time to recover. But the interesting thing is the tourism will come back very quickly because they see the importance of it to their economy. And the other thing um, is in the long run, I think they're really going to benefit because all the focus is going there, all the insurance money, all the government re, uh, rebuilding money. And I think what we'll see is actually that the economy of, of Puerto Rico, for example, will be much stronger even uh, in a few years. The time to get there will be horrific for everybody, but the end result will be a stronger and more vibrant economy. And you've already seen it. We were the first ship back into Key West. Just yesterday or the day before? Yeah. The day before, and um, 
Key West was, as you know, got the direct hit of the brunt of the storm. And this is one of the biggest Atlantic storms in history. Mm -hmm. And by uh, the day before yesterday, it was back in operation. And our guests say um, almost no sign of it. It's amazing how um, really people came together to, to work to, to help each other and to recover from this. Uh, moving off of breaking news now, you, your company, Royal Caribbean International, the brand, introduced the largest passenger ship in the world, almost 10 And the years best, ago. in case anybody was It's interested. yours. I you am, also, I have a brochure here if you're interested. <laughs> I, am, I am objective here, and this um, Oasis of the Seas was the ship. It's been around since 2009. Um, since then, no one's gone bigger except you, and only just by... Not, maybe not inches, but feet, only by a little bit. Have cruise ships really maxed out in terms of size? Is there demand to go bigger, or does nobody want to take a cruise with more than you know 5,400 of their closest fellow cruisers? You, you, know, you know, Hannah, it's interesting. When I, uh, you mentioned that I've been in the business almost 30 years. When I started in the business, the issue that we were facing was: should we build a new ship? And at all, a, just at a all, ship. just okay. a new ship. Uh, but we were going to build a bigger ship. What was then would have been the largest ship ever built. It was, by the way, a third the size of Oasis. Mm -hmm. um, and the question at the time was three things. One, we had just built a ship five years earlier. Could there possibly be demand for another ship that soon? And I'm, I'm laughing, and you're making it funny because now they come out like a now couple we of get years. As many as four a year, yeah. yeah. Um, the second question was, um, this ship would be more than 1,000 berths. Would anybody want to go with more than 1,000 people? And the third was, we're already going to three other itineraries. Is there really a fourth itinerary to go to? And we now have 480 different itineraries around the world. Uh, I think what's happened is the world has changed, and people's view of cruising has changed. And um, what the larger ships offer is an opportunity to offer more amenities, more activities, more things to do. And the result has been that whereas the old theory was the smaller ships are more intimate and they charge a higher price because they're more luxurious, the bigger ships are sort of mass market. Who wants to go with thousands of other of their closest friends? And so they charge less. And what's happened is the beauty of the larger ships has been so great uh, and we've reinvested the economy of scale so that they're actually getting higher per diems on the larger ship. So the Oasis of the Seas and its sister ships um, are probably some of the most profitable ships um, operating on the seas today. So why not you know, kick that up a little bit, add another 1,000? Well, it's funny you should mention that. Wait, are you going to make news right now? <laughs> I'm not making news. Okay. Um, our lawyer spoke to me before I came. Okay. Uh, <laughs> But as you said, we made the second ship a little bit larger. The third ship we made a fair bit larger, so we started adding meters instead of inches. Uh, and we have um, two more of those ships on order. And we have a new class of ship called Icon, which is even larger. So we have, um, uh, we have found that there is a demand for this sort of thing. Um, and it fits in with people's uh, wishes to go to different places. So, yeah, we, we'll continue with that. It's working for us. All right. Um, in addition to going bigger, how else are you thinking about innovation in cruise ship design? I know you're a guy who likes to like sit in all the seats and really be into all the details of construction. Um, there's only a couple of shipyards that can make the kind of vessels that you need. And... I don't think the basics of shipbuilding have changed that much. So how do you kind of reinvent the wheel, so to speak, when you're building ships? Well, you know, um, it's been in the, our DNA, actually from the beginning, from the 1970s when the cruise line first started, to be innovative. It was the first ship which started w with the kinds of operation that you're seeing in the, cru in the cruise industry today. Uh, we started with the first atrium at sea. The number of firsts that we've been involved in has been very high. And as you say, a lot of that is the innovation that's been driven by our new building team, which is really a terrific set of people who just um, are impossible to work with, but come up with great ideas. 
Uh, yeah, I somehow wish that you could find somebody who was easy to work with and had great ideas. Somehow the two never seem to come together. It might be watching. I'm just telling you, I, it's possible. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I forget what I just said. <laughs> uh, but um, I think part of what's made us successful is that it really isn't one person or a group of person. It's something that's part of our DNA. And so everybody feels empowered to come out with weird ideas. Oh, tell, can, tell me like three of them. Tell me the weirdest. Well, I, I, I remember actually one of the early things we did to try and get across the idea that cruising isn't sedentary was we had a space on the ship and we asked people to come up with an idea. And their idea was a rock climbing wall. And frankly, um, I thought that was one of the dumber ideas I've ever heard. <laughs> Uh, rejected it out of hand and gave them the option of coming up with three alternatives. <laughs> and they came up with not three, but five alternatives. Uh, but it turns out that the rock climbing wall was the least dumb of the five ideas. <laughs> so um, we, we had no choice. I mean, I had to do there. something with the space. So we put up this dumb rock climbing <laughs> wall. And it turns out the guests love it. I finally realized it was the best idea I ever had. Yeah, good. So, <laughs> so and, and then um, we've put it on all of our ships. So yeah. that's the way these things go. But I would disagree with you on one thing. The technology of shipbuilding has dramatically changed. Oh, good. Um, the technology of design has changed, and the technology of construction has changed. The most important thing is the technology of design. Mm. Uh, we used to design using, before we had CAD, we had something called SAD. You know, CAD is computer-aided design. SAD is scissors-aided design. And scissors-aided design was basically you, you took pieces of paper and cut them out and pasted them on the, on the wall and tried to put together that way. Now you have um, uh, 3D mm -hmm. renderings. You can print out spaces and see what they look like. In our more recent edition, we created something we're calling an innovation lab, which is basically has simply two things in it. One is collaboration space, so these weird people can talk together. Um, and secondly, it is a 3D virtual reality simulator. Mm -hmm. So think of the holodeck on the Starship Enterprise. We have our own holodeck, and we can walk in. And so when you're visualizing a design, you're not looking at renderings, which an architect has put together, and they always lie. You know, the architect drawings, in 30 years, I've never seen an architect's drawing that didn't look wonderful. But when they built it, sometimes it didn't quite look the same. And the reason was they always chose the perfect place to look from, and they kind of cheated when they did it. They made it look taller or wider or what have you. Now, we have these rooms we walk into, right. and we can see it all. And we can walk around, and you can literally walk around it. So you don't have to be as um, into the space. You can just walk around it. The other thing is the same technology integrates with what the construction is at the yard. So you can build more um, into the vessel. Um, it used to be that everything had to be square because it's hard to cut something other than square um, if a person is doing it. it. Turns out if a computer is doing it, it's just as simple to make it an oval shape as it is a square shape. And so the, the meeting up of the technology of the construction and the technology of the design creates some wonderful new stuff. So we're quite excited. And that sounds, I mean, that sounds like a good kind of disruption, which transitions to the next question. Um, Airbnb has been disrupting hotels. Uber is disrupting um, all kinds of driving. What, if anything, is poised to disrupt cruising? Or are you guys lucky because it takes a billion dollars to build a new ship? Well, first of all, I don't think I'm lucky that it costs a billion dollars to build a ship. <laughs> I, I just, you know, it's a double edged you know, There's just no way you can spin that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you're right. It does, it, it does add a few um, barriers to entry. Um, and, but actually, interestingly enough, the barriers to entry today are probably more the infrastructure. It's the people and it's the systems because, um, as some of the earlier speakers have talked about, people no longer want to figure things out when they get there. They want everything easy, and to do that requires an amazing amount of technology. 
So it's not just the ships that's the barriers to entry. It's also the systems, the people, the infrastructure. Um, but I remember a number of years ago, we were looking at a dramatically new type of ship. And the concern we had at the time was this new ship um, was so much better, we felt, than our older vessels. Was it yours? Sorry? Was it your ship? Yes. Oh, yeah. OK. It, well, we were actually in the design phase. And we felt it had so many more amenities than we had before. Larger staterooms, more public areas, more activities, et cetera. And so there was a great deal of concern that we would obsolete our older vessels, which were quite profitable. And we did take um, an idea from the tech industry, which was then really embryonic, and um, picked up the mantra of it's better to obsolete yourself than to have somebody else obsolete you. Um, and today, I guess you would say it's better to disrupt yourself than have somebody else disrupt you. And um, so I think we see our biggest disruptor, we hope will continue to be ourselves. And the industry has changed. The industry is so different than anything we've talked about in the past. Um, and the role of destinations, what people are looking for. So when I got into the industry, it had an image, which I, of course, would never repeat. But just between the two of us, um, people used to say cruising was for the newly wed, the overfed, and the nearly dead. Uh, um, I, don't, I don't know that some people don't still think that. No. But, but nobody would say that today. Uh, and I would never repeat it in public. It's a great rhyme also. Um, but that was an image that the industry had. And what it's really done is transformed itself. So that one of the things that I find fascinating when we do surveys, the number of people who, um, have, who would say that cruising is perfect for me has doubled in the last seven years. Doubled. And that's the average person. And when we look at millennials, it's almost tripled, which is counterintuitive. So let's talk about millennials for a minute. Do you care about millennials? Do you, are you actively trying to get them? Are you sick of them? everybody talking about them? Well, as a father and grandfather, I'm sometimes, <laughs> no, um, I won't say that. But uh, um, it is our future. There is simply no question. Um, they set a lot of the standards that other people follow. And so, yes, it's very important that we get them. And the fastest growing part of our business is actually family travel. Family travel with um, uh, parents and their children, and more, more recently, um, multi-generational traveling. Mm -hmm. And once we get those children, we own the parents and the grandparents, because they have such a good time on the cruise that we never have to worry about losing them. So what's your trick for those? You said there was a stat about millennials like that's gone up tremendously. The ones who say cruising is perfect. What's, how are you doing that? Like, What's your trick to getting their attention or their loyalty? Well, actually, I think it's no trick. I think, fortunately, we are blessed because um, our, what we offer happens to fit in with the way people are acting these days. So when we've gone through the series, I've been with the company long enough to go through the, the different kinds of cycles. But one of the, the fairly dramatic change that we're seeing in society is that whereas we recently went through a period where people were looking at um, things. I want uh, a new car. I want a new flat screen TV, uh, what have you, new refrigerator, all those things. We seem to be beyond that. And people now seem to be putting much more value in, in memories, in adventure, in activities. They want to do things that have meaning to them. Mm -hmm. um, and so the experience is what they're looking for. And thankfully, we happen to be an industry that offers experience. So you do see us doing more and more to provide more choice to our guests, um, to do more with the destinations that we go to, uh, and to provide more experiences, more memories. And that's a sweet spot that, that helps us. And that's been part of our growth. So we will continue to provide that kind of service. You talked about choice. Um, and 
I think that um, Chris before us also kind of was talking about direct booking with Jason. A lot of, a tremendous percent of cruise passengers book their cruises with a travel agent. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated booking. Sometimes people aren't always sure what they're doing. Are you, at the risk of angering <laughs> any travel agents here, but are you looking at, like hotels are, ways to make it easier or um, to get the number of people who book directly to increase with Royal Caribbean? Um, or are you at least trying to um, take down any barriers that exist for that? Um, you know, we won't anger anybody because um, the, uh, I don't see the two as being in conflict. Uh, the bulk of our customers still come from the travel agents, uh, but um, also more and more people want to have that direct connection with us. But whoever we're dealing with, we have to make it easy. We have just all become so spoiled. Uh, you know, when Apple first came out with the iPhone just a decade ago, and when you looked at some of the apps that came out, they were, it, one of the things that was remarkable about it was just how easy it was. You mm -hmm. just opened the box. There was no instruction manual. Um, you didn't need an instruction manual. It was just obvious. And then that was remarkable. Today, we consider that a price of entry. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the expectations that it has to be easy. And so we have to make it easy, whether it's through a travel agent or directly, however you do it. And I don't see, and, and we've put, we're investing enormous resources in doing that. Uh, and I don't see the two as being in conflict. The travel agent provides an expertise and a knowledge and an experience that nobody else gets. And remember, cruising is, an, a, is a considered purchase. If I screw up my family's vacation, I will hear about it for the next year and a half. And so I'm going to be very cautious about that. Mm -hmm. And so the things I want are information. Well, we have to provide that information. The travel agent has to provide it. We have to provide it to the travel agent. We have to provide it directly. We have to provide you that information however you want to get it. And so we're investing a, a great deal into doing that. You're, and you're actively like in the midst of this kind of tech overhaul to enable that? And, and we have been for quite a while. I think our use of technology is, is very broad. And I think part of what makes our use of technology different than some of the other discussions you've had here is it's, it's, it's holistic. It's the whole business. So we all talk about, and it's an important part, the technology that the customer sees. Mm -hmm. How easy it is for me to book a cruise, how easy it is for me to book a, a dinner reservation, how easy a shore excursion, whatever it is. And that has to be there. But ours is still a people business. Mm -hmm. And um, we have 67,000 employees around the world working hard every day to um, uh, give our guests amazing. Just what they do is I'm in awe of. Just, it's just amazing. And one of the key roles that we're using technology to do to make it easier for them to help the guest. Mm -hmm. So if you come. Um, and for the, uh, I don't know this, but if you like uh, olives in your martini, um, it should help. Uh, uh, for the rest of the record, I don't know the answer to that question. Don't even like martinis. Uh, uh, <laughs> you don't like martinis? Oh, sorry. But if you did, our bartenders should know that. And that should be available to them. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we can do. The other thing is our employees um, come from all over the world. They often come on the ship, work very hard for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so um, being able to communicate home is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did a couple of years ago was simply give every Royal Caribbean employee, every single one, a tablet. And with Wi-Fi on our ships, they can then Skype home. So, you know, um, 10 years ago, they would have Maybe they write home, they maybe get to go home and see them when they on vacation, but that would be it. Mm -hmm. So the technology in terms of making their life better makes our guest life better, and a happy crew also makes a happy guest. In less than a minute, um, in our countdown, I, I don't want to go away without very quickly talking about politics. Um, 
Celebrity, which is one of your brands, ran an ad that I think some people found politically um, tinted. It was during the election. It talked about walls and borders and not in a good way. Um, I think you got a lot of feedback probably on that. What do you think is the best way, or why do you feel like it's important for your company to talk about things like that, and how do you do it without alienating some of your passengers? Um, you know, in the brief amount of time, you can have a little more than 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> There's a clock, and I now have seven left. Um, and that's probably as much time as I want to talk on this subject. <laughs> Lucky. Uh, uh, the, the, the um, um, you know, we're not, a polit we're, we're not political, and we don't intend to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think our, our guests and our employees expect us to stand up for certain um, values, and, and we do as a company, but we don't do that in a political way. And I think um, we see opportunity to uh, reinforce the things that we stand for, um, but not by being, uh, in a sense, controversial or confrontational. So um, we have a very strong partnership with WWF. Uh, we've set quite exacting goals for ourselves on greenhouse gases, um, on sustainable f fisheries, uh, on sustainable destination development. So these kinds of things are important to our values, but I don't consider them controversial or taking political positions. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Hannah.